Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast. Today, uh, we're going to, well, first, we're going to talk about uh, Matt Gates. I, there, there really needs to be some kind of language reform with the guy's name. I spent years thinking it was Gates, but it's Gates. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's just G-A-T-E-S, the normal Gates, just spelled differently. Anyway, uh, we spent almost the whole of the last episode talking about his both serious and sort of absurd scandal. Um, not absurd in the sense of of what seems to be the underlying crimes, but just he, he's just sort of an absurd figure and everything he touches becomes absurd. And that has uh, progressed over the last week. Uh, I think Kate was the first one to report yesterday that he's now fundraising off his statutory rape investigation, which that's new. That's not, you know, normally kind of that's that's not a good that's not a good scandal. You know, some scandals are worse than others, but you, you would think that's pretty bad. Right. Um, uh, but, you know, that we're in the in the post Trump, uh, you know, uh, GOP. So we're going to talk about that again. There's a few different things uh, uh, going on on that front. And, uh, you know, it's 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 funny before I, I was just thinking I actually I forgot the second thing we're going to talk about, but that's because before we went on the air, my uh, we had started recording the episode and my mic broke. And I don't mean like broke, like it wasn't picking up the uh, picking up sound right. You know, you have like a mic stand and the and and you kind of adjust the mic so it's kind of at one angle and it just started like drooping. And and I said, all right, we got to stop because this is like. <laughs> is you know is 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 both uh breaking my concentration and sort of oddly demoralizing right <laughs> um so anyway so that that kind of uh uh so i don't even know what what well i can what you been, yeah I what, can what, help what, you out, josh yeah what yeah. was the next thing we we're going to discuss we're going to talk about the gop's turn against big business oh right right the 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 breakdown uh in the in the cozy relationship between corporate america and the gop but but uh, in addition, we've got another thing that we're going to discuss, and that is that this is the last episode that that David will be with us as a co-host because David is taking another uh, job uh, outside of, uh, you know, uh, uh, leaving TPM. Um, so leaving the podcast as 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 part of that. And I, I'll, I'll let him in a moment sort of uh, tell us. Uh, what his plans are and all of that. But let me just say, I, I met David more than 10 years ago now, when um, just over 10 years ago, when he joined TPM as an intern and then uh, became a full-time employee, you know, an intern, I think right out of college, maybe even like literally right out of college. That's right. Like first, yeah, thing, exactly. first thing after uh, graduation, maybe a, you know, a uh, little, little downtime during the summer. Uh, and then became a uh, full-time staff and was was uh, really a key part of the operation for a number of years and someone who, uh, you know, I was a big fan of and then uh, left and had a couple other uh, gigs and then came back to TPM four years ago. We were actually, before we went on the air, David was telling me that the day after Donald Trump's inauguration was his first day back. So kind of like, you know, almost literally back for the Trump presidency. So uh, I'm just a huge fan of David and uh, for TPM and myself, I, I'm 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 very sad that he's leaving. But, you know, uh, but that's fine. You know, uh, uh, what makes him happy makes me happy. So we're going to talk about that. And but let me just uh tell you what an important part of the life of the organization that 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 David has been before we before we get on to all that stuff let me remind you that the Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's cold brew iced coffee did anyone else just kind of assume spring wasn't going to happen then one day it just became spring and here we all do here we all oh man here we all are doing spring stuff that means tailgates picnics camping and cold brew grady's all in one cold brew makes 36 curving what is what is wrong? I'm, I'm still thrown off by the <laughs> by the microphone problem 
uh, makes 36 servings of gourmet New Orleans style coffee for less than a buck a cup. Just add water and store it in your fridge for cold brewed iced coffee you'll want to sip all spring. And be sure to take some of your some on your next vacation so you never have to worry about missing your morning brew. Ready to get a swirl? Get 25% off your first order at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. That's Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. So, uh, right. Kate and David, what, what is going on? Well, Josh, thank you for those nice words. And um, thanks to our listeners for, uh, for listening. I think this is our 167th episode, and that doesn't even necessarily count some of the one-offs we've done after the like conventions news events ones. and yeah, yeah, yeah. elections and all that kind of stuff. Um, so thank you for everything, Josh. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, want to keep in touch and all that. And Kate, I feel like it was just yesterday, a couple of years ago, you came in for an interview at TPM and I got to meet you then. And you've done great things, obviously, in your your time at TPM and will continue to do so too. So thanks to you guys. Thanks to our listeners. And maybe I'll, I'll get to come back on as a guest someday if you guys will have me. Yeah, yeah. And let our listeners know where you're going so they can- Yes. I am joining The Independent, the UK uh, newspaper, global news organization. Uh, I'll be a senior editor in the New York office, kind of helping to helm their US team and covering all the crazy stuff that uh, is happening across the country here. So, so sort exciting. of similar to what The Guardian has done, where where they have kind of a, a not just a, not just a bureau, but a, a, a separate US presence with some kind of life of its own. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And trying to carve out more of a presence in the US, US market, similar, like you said, similar to what The Guardian is doing. So it should be exciting. It's bittersweet to leave TPM, but um, like you said, kind of with Trump bookending, kind of my start and finish in a way right. at TPM, it's uh, not a bad time to, uh, to try something new. So yeah, it's, it's funny, Brits. when I think about it, it makes sense for, I, I hadn't thought about it in these terms exactly, but uh, Oh, you, you know, it's funny when when uh, years and years and years ago, when The Guardian was first uh, thinking about doing the U.S. news thing, I was kind of offered the job to kind of uh, this was in an early iteration of TPM. So it was kind of to make T kind of convert TPM mm. into Guardian U.S. or something like that. Um, in any case, it makes sense since you have I mean, uh, Great Britain's obviously a fairly large country, but relatively small compared to the United States. And right. since you have the common language, it make it it just makes sense to access the, you know, this the scale of that of that audience. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so it should be exciting. And uh, yeah, like I said, bittersweet for sure. But um, I know we'll keep in touch and see what the Christmas party, Josh. Hopefully, we'll have one of those. Yeah, in the post COVID world and all <laughs> yeah, that. Who knows? So, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, anyways, on to the news. So, Kate, well, Josh mentioned you had written yesterday about Matt Gates fundraising off of this scandal, which has taken on a whole life of its own, even since last week when we first started talking about it. Um, this whole side drama about an extortion plot and Gates going to the FBI and his dad wearing a wire to try to, you know, crack open this this blackmail scheme against him is pretty much totally dissolved and fallen to the wayside. And now it's it's really focused on the investigation that he allegedly or potentially had sex with this 17 year old girl. Um, there's lots of other kind of Florida figures and and things wrapped up to up into it. But um, what struck you is, you know, what struck you about his fundraising message? What was how's he trying to play this to his supporters as kind of like, hey, give me money. So, you know, well, well, I'm in under investigation for potential child sex trafficking. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of an extension of the PR strategy he's been using from the beginning, if you want to call it that, which I guess could most easily be described as keep yourself in the limelight no matter what even if what you're saying is completely baffling and potentially incriminating. Um, you know, he went on Tucker right away. He's been very generous with his on the record quotes to various publications. His Twitter feed has been kind of, you know, ablaze with retweets of supportive, you know, right wing figures. So in that way, the PR or the fundraising blast is kind of a natural extension of that. Um, and it, it's, very it reads very trumpian you know it's it's not an investigation it's a scandal it's salacious details not about a sex trafficking allegation of a child 
but salacious details about his dating life you know it's just like trying to kind of take especially the you know what is an allegation of sexual violence and turn it into you know they're just interested because I was a playboy you know they don't like that I was getting out there and like meeting women and how it, it is girlfriends. it is striking that that I mean you know maybe it's not just because this is the totality of his strategy but it is striking that even as this is happening he can't help but basically saying yeah I was getting a lot yeah I was doing great man I was out on the scene and I like the ladies and he's sort of like okay that's I mean that's that's fine you know uh as long as everybody's a consenting adult that's great but that's I'm not sure that's helpful right, right. I mean, exactly. sort of, <laughs> but, but, it, but he, like he can't and and maybe I mean one could argue well this is part of the strategy you're just kind of you know yeah I'm a playboy and you're trying to criminalize my kind of loush lifestyle but I get the sense it's not even strategic. He just, as long as he has the mic, mm -hmm. he's going to tell you he's, he's doing great. And that he can't help it. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of my thinking as well, which is why I'm a bit hesitant to call it a strategy because I think it's just his instinct. Like to him, if he's in the news, that's a good thing, no matter what he's in the news for. And that instinct seems to be surpassing any instinct of self-preservation or even just the very base you know desire to not go for instance on Tucker Carlson and bring up you know child prostitutes which no one had said before you know potentially adding further criminality to his case um but yeah so then this this fundraising blast is just you know stand with me to fight back against the fake news they're coming for me because they can't come for you I'm standing in the way which is just like what just even what is the logistical jump from one to another like he's being smeared so he he contends right that he is being smeared with these baseless allegations in the new york times i don't understand the leap from that to and that's why i need you to donate to my campaign like there's no real clear linkage between that if he was at least saying something like I need you to help fund my defamation lawsuit. At least there's a logical or, or link. Fund my defense. Right. Right. right? Although yeah. the funny thing, the one thing that came out in this that I didn't quite, I mean, I knew that Gates had basically gotten his, you know, gotten his seat because of his dad. His dad, you know, his dad was in a uh, Florida politician, was a big wig in the Florida, Florida state legislature. I think for a while they both served in the Florida state legislature at the same time. So I knew that his dad was a was a big deal. I didn't realize that he's extremely wealthy, like mm -hmm. like hundreds of millions of dollars wealthy, because I guess he had I mean, it's a it's a he founded a uh, well, founded a nonprofit. It, do I have this right, Kate? Founded a nonprofit hospice, um, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of franchise, you know, like yeah, a, that's a, right. yeah, yeah. A, a number of, uh, you know, a system. And then converted it to for profit, right? And I, I don't know how that happens exactly. <laughs> Generally speaking, um, you, you know, these are supposed to be a it's supposed to be a one way thing, right? Because yeah, you build it up as a as a as as, as a non profit, and then say, and now it's mine, right? <laughs> so I, so again, who knows? Um, in any case, uh, he doesn't need my, you know. He, he can fund anything. So clearly that is not really available to him, but it's a good point. It, it, how is this relevant to his next right. campaign? You it's know? just a way to, I guess it's just a way to show support, right? Or like to speak with your wallet kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah. Wait for Gates to fundraise. I yeah. Mean, yeah, yeah, just more money, more money exactly. to, to pass around and, 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 and stuff like that. Right. And but there's I, been, go ahead. There's been a, a few other reports, namely from the New York Times. There's one just last night that Gates had asked Trump for a blanket pardon in kind of the last days of, of his presidency. And it's, I guess the Times reported, it's unclear if Gates himself knew that he was under federal investigation for possible sex trafficking uh, allegations, but not a normal thing you would do as a member of Congress to just say, hey, Mr. President, uh, how about just blanket pardon for any any crimes I might have done while I've been in office or anything that maybe I, you know, could do in the near future. But um, I guess Trump 
blew it off basically. And we should remember that this Gates investigation, the federal investigation was launched under Bill Barr, Trump's attorney general, who I think was briefed on the, you know, if a mem sitting member of Congress is under criminal investigation, you'd think that goes to pretty high levels of the Justice Department as far as looping people in and, you know, presidential appointees being aware. So we don't know if Gates knew that he was under investigation when he asked for the blanket pardon, but certainly senior Trump administration officials knew what was going on. Hey, do we have, do we have any hints about when he learned he was under investigation? Well, there was the reporting that it was like mid-March, the text came through to his dad asking that he, you know, saying he could make this, his problems go away. And right. then, but that seems, I think Gates but, told Tucker that that was sort of like when he first heard about it, right? That he, the texts to his dad was kind of what tipped him off, maybe? First that he knew that there was an investigation? That's what I- mean, I, that, that seems implausible. Right. Um, I mean, we also can look at, you know, obviously this doesn't mean he knew he was in, under investigation, but if you look at the Greenberg stuff- you Right, know, and remind our listeners who- Right, so Joel Greenberg was the tax collector in Florida who was good friends with Gates. Um, the friendship spans the time that Greenberg has now been arrested and indicted on charges of alleged trafficking of a child as well. Um, and Greenberg was arrested in June 2020. So again, we don't, you know, we don't know for sure that Gates knew he was also under investigation, but we, the pieces are coming together that we see there, they were doing a lot of this stuff together. So you have to think he had an inkling that if Greenberg was going down, yeah. he might be next. Well, and that's, that's, I mean, as I understand this, so we at least, you know, allegedly, I mean, even if you set aside, was there a 17 year old? Did, did Gates know she was 17 years old as opposed to 18, which, you know, you probably shouldn't be sleeping with an 18 year old either, but obviously it's legally very significant. Clearly they were, uh, you know, escorts, prostitution, you know, they were in, they were doing stuff with the, with the same group of women, A, and there's this report that they were that that Gates at least was aware of this kind of scam with the IDs. Um, so once he gets indicted and he's going to be investigated for a long time before he's indicted. If I'm Gates, I'm thinking, oh, uh, that's that's getting a little close because I know we had a sex trafficking ring. Right. So <laughs> it it and, and the other thing that that. Uh, my recollection is that bar 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 being notified and that other guy getting arrested both happened like in June, 2020. So it really seems highly implausible to me that he didn't know he was in some kind of trouble, um, you know, way, you know, way back into um, way back in, into 2020. Uh, but obviously we don't, you know, we, we don't know that, I guess. Yeah. Well, and to be fair, on the on the pardon front, Gates wasn't really doing anything that Trump wasn't talking about doing. You know, I mean, we had all those reports of Trump kind of testing the waters of his advisors of, you know, can I preemptively pardon myself and my family? And, you know, that was like a, a hot idea on the Republican side for a while. Uh, you know, not that that really gives us an indication on Gates one way or another, but it does at least kind of... Like bolster like, his ask. <laughs> I feel like there were also reports about would he give certain people just you know kind of plenary pardons mm -hmm. anything and everything we're not even going to get into what you did it's a clean it's a clean slate so yeah. it and and obviously he decided not to do that and it's not and it's uh that is not in itself um unprecedented because that's actually what Gerald Ford did with Richard Nixon now I don't I don't remember the I, I don't remember the exact wording of that pardon, whether it was anything he did during his presidency, Nixon, or anything tied to the to the Watergate scandal. Sort of same difference, but it was but that was the point. It was like everything. Anything come up with, it's done, done and done. Uh but it is it is it is funny 
when you think about just the weirdness of the Trump world, when like you're asking for uh, you're asking for a pardon, but you're not even willing to say what you really want it for. Like we don't have to get into that. Let's just say you give me a pardon and let's just <laughs> We're not going to get into what I did. It's too it's too much. It's too much more than you can handle Trump. We know Trump is not a big details guy either. Right. So. uh, Yeah. Well, the the interesting question to me is, did Trump know? Right. Because it it kind of goes both ways. I mean, normally the AG should just say, all right, I got that. I'm not telling the president about it. That's. that puts everybody in an awkward position, right? It's just, it's a legal thing, whatever. But, and I, I don't know exactly, I don't remember exactly what DOJ policy is on this, but in some cases you may wanna say, the, the attorney general may wanna say to the president, hey, that guy's under investigation. You, you should keep your distance from him. Uh, for, as a, you know, kind of the equivalent of uh, in, it, 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 we that we learn from the Russia probe, you know, a defensive briefing to kind of say, hey, that person's a spy. You need to you need to cut off contact, um, something similar to that. So I so I, I don't know exactly what even would have been the correct thing, but obviously Bill Barr wasn't restrained by anything like that. So you could you could imagine him um, either doing it in a corrupt way or actually doing it in a in a way that was not at least intentionally corrupt to just say you got this guy's bad news you got to stay away from him um it's a it's i mean given what we know this has always been one of the most interesting thing, things to me about trump trump made it his business with people like michael cohen and other people kind of like to, to know everybody's vulnerability, know everything that's going on, because those chits are, are power. Um, and, you know, you, you, there's that great, uh, I, I think this was, I, I can't remember um, where it came up, but there's that great uh, anecdote about Michael Cohen that he's, you know, kind of building a relationship with the Falwells as, you know, as part of working for Trump and he sees Giancarlo one day and he's like, who's that guy? Right. Like, you know, he smells it a mile away, right? He's got it. Cause that's his, that's his, that's what he does. And I don't think, I don't think Cohen's the only guy who, who plays that role for Trump, you know, uh, extortion and uh, secrets. That is the, the sort of the currency of power in Trump world. So, I would be surprised if Trump didn't know what what was up. Trump put out a, a pretty half-hearted statement today. It was like two sentences, which is pretty short for Trump in these post-presidency email statements that are basically just like Twitter rants in email form. But um, something like, Matt Gates never asked me for a pardon. It should be remembered that he has denied the claims against him or something like that. It was a pretty low energy uh, you know, yeah, it didn't go for any of the fake news or exactly. Biden Justice Department or witch hunt. It was just kind of like innocent to proven guilty. Right. That's what the which Constitution is, says. You know, which is kind of funny because you know the the Gates campaign or the Gates office dispatched this former aide to give a press briefing last week, um, which that was after our pod, right? Yeah. 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 And. You know, it was this guy had been approached by FBI agents who he said said that they'd been contacted by media saying that he this this former staffer had knowledge of illegal activities carried out by Gates and that's why he left Gates's office. So this guy was there to you know say that's not true. The, those allegations are baseless. Thus, I also believe the allegations against Gates are baseless. And then you know the first reporter who gets a question is like, do you have what evidence do you have that Gates is innocent? And he's like, oh, I'm not here to offer evidence. And it was just so funny because the whole thing, you would think upon seeing the press release that this is going to be akin to a character defense. You know, they're putting this guy out here to be like, I've worked with Matt Gates for four years. He would never do such a thing. And the, it was just so totally absent from that. Like he did not say, 
one word in support of Gates until almost the end of the event when kind of prompted by a reporter, he did, you know, he gave him such accolades as he's a quote, strong congressman, he, you know, powerhouse in DC, gets things done for Floridians. But the whole thing was just, I mean, weird soup to nuts. Weird, first of all, that, you know, this this kind of media invite went out on official Gates Gates's congressional office letterhead for this guy who does not work for Gates' office anymore. Uh, you know, weird that he seemed to give this press briefing in front of his house. Weird that he was, it, the way it read to me was this guy was up there to be like, I didn't do anything. I'm not part of this. And then a reporter was like, and Gates isn't either, right? And then he was like, oh, right, right. Not him either. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming today. <laughs> well, what, what struck, the other thing that struck me about that is that he, I mean, the FBI gets a tip. They follow up on the tip. Hey, we heard you know something. Do you know something? And the guy says, no, I don't know anything. Okay. You know, maybe, and, and maybe the investigators would think he's lying or not, but there's nothing weird about that. And, and, and his main, as I understood it, his main, you know, kind of argument on behalf of Gates was like, oh yeah, FBI trying to find something that's not there. You know, so basically he said, the fact that they asked me about something that wasn't true, mm -hmm. just told me that Gates is totally innocent. Well, right. Even though that's, you that's a non sequitur. That makes no <laughs> sense at all, right? And maybe you're lying, but I mean, if right. you're not lying, it still does, it's just a total non sequitur. I mean, the thing that's still, uh, the, the overriding thing to me about this whole story is that he is acting as though he will stand or fall in this case based on winning news cycles, winning the morning, right? And, you know, in his ecosystem, he may be winning the morning, right? I mean, certainly uh, you've got at least the sort of the more feral right-wingers like on, oh, Matt Gates, you know, he's, he's, He's taken the hit for us. I don't know, because maybe the us is other people who who ran sex rings. I have no idea. But um, it, it's, you know, fundamentally, that is not true. You know, it was it could be true. And it was true for some people under Trump because Trump had that unique ability to short circuit the entire criminal justice system and just issue a pardon. And and maybe playing to the media didn't do something, but playing to Trump clearly did. I mean, think about that guy from upstate New York who had the sort of insider trading thing, had to resign, went to jail. I guess what was he in for, I guess, less than a year and he's pardoned and he's good to go. Um, so it made sense, you know, for him to, 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 to um, remain friendly, but it's not even a matter of like, you know, Biden's in power, so he's not going to get any mercy. It's just not how the federal criminal justice system works. Like these things get started and even in sometimes in bad ways, once there's an investigation, they're really going to run it to ground. And certainly for some people, it actually does become not corrupt, but you know, once they decide you're a bad guy, they're really going to look for look for a way to indict you. And now uh, some prosecutor is going to say it's not how it works. I know that's not, you know, but it just, it just moves forward. They do not give a fuck how, how many people you're owning on Tucker Carlson. It's just, it's just not relevant. So like, you know, he'll be winning the morning every morning until he's sentenced to prison basically. And there's kind of this weird subplot too, that, Gates wrote this op-ed in the Washington Examiner recently where like 75% about of it was kind of what about ism with like various Democrats over the years who have, you know, engaged in sexual impropriety or, you know, more serious potential crimes kind of thing. But then towards the end of that, he brings up Katie Hill, who is the Congresswoman who was kind of forced to resign very early in her term because uh, you know, she engaged in an inappropriate relationship with a subordinate from her campaign. Um, and the whole thing was just like very messy. She was in the middle of an acrimonious divorce at the time. And, you know, pictures taken without her consent were disseminated. And 
this whole thing. And at that time, Gates was one of the very few people that stood up for her. And I'm not talking just one of the very few Republicans, one of the very few people in general, because obviously, especially since the advent of the Me Too movement, Democrats have aligned themselves, you know, generally with, you know, some striking Cuomo exemptions right now, have generally aligned themselves on the side of, you know, we're going to believe women, we're going to take sexual assault seriously, at least much more seriously than Republicans do. So a lot of crickets from the Democrats on that side of things. And she ultimately resigned. And she actually wrote an op-ed um, that I just found really fascinating about her friendship with Gates. And this was kind of her response because she said she gets media inquiries pretty much every time a member of Congress does anything, you know, sexually uh, inappropriate or illegal kind of asking her like you left for this but they don't have to leave how do you feel about that kind of thing so she addressed that in this piece um, you know and concludes on this on this strong note of you know if if Gates did do just a fraction of what he's accused of especially including you know there is a piece of this story that is reported that Gates showed pictures of the of women he slept with two other members on the house floor which is you know that Not just is pictures big, nude pictures right which is yeah. like cousins with what happened to hill you know which she's kind of made into her mission to get that criminalized now but you know so she said he should absolutely resign if he did these things and some of what he does what he did you know seems to be criminal etc cetera, etc cetera. but i just thought that kind of twist in the story was so gross of Gates I guess because you know he at the time took this kind of stand that was unpopular in his party right and I mean it, think of it what you will but what Hill did was definitely inappropriate but it was not illegal you know so he kind of came out in solidarity with her and then in his like op-ed to defend himself is like you know, just kind of so crass about that it was like, I was on her side. It was nobody's business. It's nobody's business. And when I do it, and again, you're like, this is not about your dating life. You know, this is not about you. You're too much of a playboy. This is because you're under investigation for potentially, you know, coercing a girl, an underage girl to have sex with you. And, you know, the trafficking connotes that it was across state lines, which invokes the federal age of consent, which is 18. But, you know, I just, I hate this twist to make it into like, oh, it's dating, it's sex. No, it's not, it's violence. That's what's at the core of this. Sexual violence isn't sex, it's violence. You know, and that attempt to twist it to make it into like the liberal media just cares about my salacious sex life is just so gross, especially because right now, like we have no idea of like the state of the girl involved in this case. You know, there are tons of implications and kind of gross uh, you know, guess at work about like what kind of girl she might be. Who cares? She's 17. You know, my little sister's 18. And I find this whole thing just horrific. And to have him turn it into kind of like, this is what I get for being a playboy is like, no, this is what you get for preying on children, allegedly, is what's at the center of this investigation. I, I was struck at the time. I was, I mean, I, I, I guess it it has I, I've learned now that it has been, you know, he Gates has made no secret that he's like a you know, a playboy and dates lots of women and stuff like that before this scandal came up. I didn't I just hadn't, you know, didn't care, didn't know. That was not on my radar. But at the time when the Katie Hill thing happened, I was impressed that he was taking her side because it's not that she did nothing wrong. In, and uh, had to do, I guess, the the woman who was who she was involved with, and there was some kind of triad with her husband. I guess was also given a job in her in her congressional office and had been part of her campaign. But basically, it seemed to me that she had to resign because she was involved. I mean, it's a, a triad relationship. Uh, uh, it, also, I guess, a, a, a lesbian relationship with this woman. There's pictures of her naked and everybody's like, uh, she's got to go, which that's not. That's not right. Um, yes, there was this issue with, you know, kind of putting this uh, giving this this woman a job. But basically, I think she got 
held to a standard that I have not seen applied anywhere else. Um, so I was, you know, uh, like, okay, great. That's great. You're, you know, uh, taking an unpopular position or what, you know, when, when, when Gates said that, but now it's come out and I'm, I'm really kind of curious what this is about that, that he was, there was a, uh, a sex trafficking law passed, I guess sometime in 2020, or maybe it was in 2019. And he was the only member of the house to vote against it. Um, and it should be, I don't know that particular legislation, but it should be said that sex trafficking, there is a good argument that new laws against sex trafficking are often structured in a way that they just add more punishment to sex workers who claim not to be trafficked and you know the traffickers aren't punished it's just it's punishing people who either are not trafficked at all or are the victims so there are some sex trafficking laws where there may be arguments for voting against it because they're uh you know uh too much federal involvement maybe just sort of like furtive ways to be more punitive towards sex workers. But that kind of did stand out to me, like especially since it seems like at the time he was actually involved in some sort of sex, sex trafficking. I mean, even if you um, even if you take the alleged involvement of a minor out of the equation, I think and Kate, you're deeper into the story. So tell me if I'm right, the general idea seems to be that Greenberg and him were recruiting women who would basically have sex in exchange, you know, pay, pay the hotel room, pay your flight, this, you know, kind of uh, prostitution, even if they kind of, you know, structured it in ways to have deniability and stuff like that. And also, you know, these women, they would, and again, assuming for the moment that all of them were over the age of 18, which is not necessarily the case, but just, again, that hypothetical. Um, you have one woman who said, hey, you got any friends who want to join our club? So, I mean, you know, it's bad stuff. It's bad stuff. Even if, even if everybody involved was 18 and you take that out of the equation, it's clear that they were all like, 18, 19, 20, you know, which makes it substantively pretty similar, even even if 17, 18 is a big legal distinction. Right. Well, I guess we have one report from the Daily Mail saying that within weeks, potentially Gates will be indicted. Obviously, take that with a grain of salt. But Kate or Josh, do you have a sense of where the story goes from here? Um, obviously, these investigations go at their own pace. Um, in the background, it's not like we get briefings from the FBI saying, here's where we're at in this, uh, you know, this stage of things. But Gates seems, like you said, to be basically kind of proudly defending himself against the claims, fundraising off of it. Um, I don't know, just what's your sense of kind of how it plays out or, or I don't know where it goes from here. I'd say my only inclination is that we're just getting so much information so fast right now that to me, you get the sense that we're moving towards this thing pretty quickly, just because as soon as the New York Times broke that story, I mean, it's like every day we're getting kind of a new piece of the puzzle in a way that I don't think really happens as often with, you know, investigations of this kind of level of, um, you know, people involved are going to be discreet about it because they, they're going to know how explosive this is when it comes out. So, you know, I think if you look at other cases like this, the the leaks usually start to start flowing when we're almost wrapped up, you know, when we're near the end. But you know, that's that's just kind of my my sense comparing this to similar scandals we've seen um, the, in recent years. The big thing that I that I saw from that Daily Mail article, and again, I basically don't assume anything that appears in the Daily Mail is true, but was the claim that Greenberg is cooperating now against Gates. Right. Um, and that would obviously be pretty bad news for Gates. Um, my understanding of the reporting we've seen so far is that the, the 
then underaged, the, the, the now woman who was then 17, when Gates allegedly had some sort of assignation with her or statutory rape of her, um, that she's already been appeared before a grand jury and presumably incriminated him. So I, I assume in the way these things work, the someone in Gates's position often has the defense of like, hey, I didn't know she was that old and you get to an intent issue and that's maybe a defense. But if Greenberg is, is, is willing to testify against him, that probably, that's pretty bad. And my understanding is that, um, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, trafficking, I'm not, is, is, Kate, is Greenberg charged with child trafficking mm -hmm. or he is? Yeah. So, okay, I, I wasn't sure if it was just trafficking in general, tra child trafficking. I think I saw that that is a minimum 10 year federal sentence. Minimum. Really stiff penalties. Yeah. Um, and then the other stuff with the public corruption stuff is also, so, I mean, that guy's looking at like life changing sentences. Um, and it sounds at least that he did more bad stuff than Gates because whatever they were involved with on the sexual front, he also had all sorts of just kind of money corruption stuff. But if you're him, you're going to do anything you can to get you know, to at least get down to a sentence that you can come back from, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I don't, it, it, given what we know now and how these things tend to work, you, you don't see it a lot where, as, as you suggested, Kate, where there's a federal investigation, there's lots of leaks, there's like lots what seems to be a lots of very direct evidence of 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 criminality on a lot of different fronts and there and it just ends up being well nope we turned turned out it was okay we're moving on that just doesn't seem to happen um so yeah i i i have to imagine he's he probably will and he probably will be indicted and in a sense you can see that from gates's own actions his actions presuppose, yes, I'm going to be indicted and I need to kind of build up this defense of this is a political prosecution. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, I was struck, he ended his, uh, that Washington Examiner op ed with some line that was like, you know, and you can expect more drip, drip, drip of fake allegations from the corrupt Justice Department and the, you know, fake news. And you're like, oh, okay. So he is literally preparing us for more breaks in this case. <laughs> well, I was I was struck by that when he actually had that drip, drip, drip quote, because normally that is a that is a statement from people who are either cheering on an investigation right. or saying someone's toast. And he's and he's putting it up as a defense. Yeah, just the same old drip, drip, drip of more <laughs> accusations of rape and child trafficking against me. How predictable, <laughs> you know, like that's Blasted. creative. My turn yeah. under the gun. He keeps yeah. using that. He's saying like, I'm the conservative they're coming after this time. And it's like, who else, <laughs> you know, who else has been in this position? I, the whole thing is just wild. Yeah. Well, we only have just a couple of minutes left, but um, maybe we can talk briefly about the the GOP's turn against big business. And it, it just was striking to think about, you know, this this week we've seen a number of companies, uh, I guess last week into this week, Del the CEO of Delta speaking out against the Georgia restrictive voting law. We have Coca-Cola doing the same. Um, the Major League Baseball All-Star Game being moved from Atlanta to, I guess, Coors Field in Denver, Colorado. Anyways, it's kind of created this big rift in the Republican Party between a normally pro-business kind of political party to now all of a sudden accusing corporations of being woke and kind of cancel, you know, cancel culture and all this type of stuff. It just reminded me of, I guess, back in 2012, there was that famous Mitt Romney line, I think it was at the Iowa State Fair, where he's like, corporations are people, my friend, if you remember that, like, <laughs> right, that was kind of right, a gaffe. Right. I mean, it was kind of a gaffe at the time, but it was like, obviously, an, an admission of, you know, a political perspective or point of view. And now we have Nikki Haley, herself, maybe a 2024 contender, calling big companies the, the new liberal mob. We have Mitch McConnell in a press conference in Kentucky, saying that corporations should just stay out of politics. And, you know, this comes after the Citizens United ruling, which McConnell backed and basically, you know, the Supreme Court 
said that corporations do have basically full throated First Amendment rights that they are. It's totally fine for them to be involved in politics and kind of with unfettered access. So anyways, I don't know, Josh, I'm just curious, what do you make of all this? Like, are you surprised that this is kind of gone in this direction? Or is it just the natural, I don't know, conclusion of kind of like Republicans trying to, I don't know, cry victimhood or something after like, you know, getting some criticism. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think the, like the citizens United stuff or the, or the sort of the shift towards the, you know, political empowerment of, of, of corporations over the last 10 or 20 years uh, figures into it much because there's nothing we're talking about here that corporations couldn't have done any time in the last 150 years. I mean, that, you know, they can, they can, uh, make announcements. They can, they can, uh, you know, pull their business out of certain places and stuff like that. Um, the, the two things that 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 uh, uh, jump out to me is that you know, no corporation, with maybe the exception of like Ben and Jerry's, is like woke, mm -hmm. right? Hey. Their actions are a pretty good proxy for the what is anticipated in the future and where purchasing power is you know it 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 sort of speaks for itself and i don't even think you know some i saw someone saying today that coke uh which is based in atlanta has a pretty long history of being uh forward looking on civil rights issues you know going back a number of decades in in atlanta and that may be the case and, uh, you know, uh, voting rights is a particular issue. But again, I think it's basically that this just tells you where corporate reputations are going and where purchasing power is going. Um, it just speaks for itself. You're maybe, in the past. And maybe also just the, the workforce of these companies, right? And what they maybe demand or pressure or expect of their of leadership it, in their it, companies and all that it's both i mean the i had a post where i said you know the kind of uh cosmopolitan urban america which is that's not the same as liberal it's close it overlaps a lot but that's where sort of cultural production reputations purchasing power so the thing about the employees is kind of the same difference Right. And, and again, different kinds of employees. We're talking about the kinds of employees in a company that can exert that kind of influence in a company. I'm not sure, like with Amazon, uh, warehouse workers are not able to exercise that kind of, you know, that kind of influence. The other thing, though, is that corporations still want tax cuts. They still want low regulation. They still want passive antitrust enforcement. And that's that's the Republicans jam. Right. So and they even, you know, even when when Mitch McConnell said that thing, he even said kind of like you should stick to your proper role, which is giving campaign money, <laughs> you know, not 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 talking. So so the whole thing at some level is. A bit overdone, a bit, you know, a bit much. There's no there's no there's really not a um, th there's no real rift. They still, you know, they're still in lockstep on the basic things that each side wants. I mean, the mass of the Republican Party may want xenoph you know, xenophobia, oppose cancel culture, all these kind of things. But the elites in the Republican Party want low taxes, low regulation. That's what the sort of the, you know, the people they've put on the Supreme Court want. Um, so it's all... It's all a bit overdone. And I think what it is, is that it sort of, it shows that, again, when Coke, when Delta, when these big mega corporations do these things, it just speaks for itself. We don't think you're the future. Yeah, I thought that McConnell quote about, you know, back to your back to your proper role of just giving us money and not saying anything about it. it was such like a perfect encapsulation of you know the the huge contradiction of the Republican Party especially the Republican Party post Trump which is 
trying to make itself out to be this like the populist party, the party of the working class, you know, even though to them the working class is the white working class. But like that's how they're trying to present themselves while their donors are, you know, huge corporations, like massively wealthy, um, you know, elites to use their word. And it's that dichotomy is like, is always there under the under the surface, you know, you so and it, I think it makes for some of like the funniest moments where you have Ted Cruz, you know, dressed up like a soldier, like, you know, paddling through some body of water at the at the border, and you pretending like, you know, I, I'm just a guy, I'm just like hunter guy, like, you know, I'm here with my gun I'm just and then you're like okay you went to Harvard it's like that dichotomy is like exists so strongly throughout the Republican Party you know these like plutocratic interests while they're trying to present themselves as populists and Trump was such a perfect encapsulation of that who somehow managed to like pass himself off as this like you know I'm I'm the self-made man, you know, I, I'm the every man who can make it. And you're like, you were born extremely wealthy and did almost nothing successfully with said wealth. But that is just, that's the encapsulation of that. And that's what we're having now. And then it's, in some ways, it just works so well for Republicans because in this cult, you know, cancel culture era, it's just, they need an enemy. Someone's got to be the enemy. And right now it's, you know, it was Dr. Seuss or it was people canceling Dr. Seuss last month and now it's corporations. But I think that, you know, it, it kind of just sets Democrats up really well because now Democrats are in the position of making the argument, we are trying to protect voter rights, right? Like that's the side that they're putting themselves on. And even though it's, becoming less and less subtle Republicans effort to suppress voting rights, they still can't just, for the most part, they can't just say we don't want as many people to vote. So they have to kind of come up with like different contortions to cover it up, whether that be voter fraud or enhancing the security of elections or whatever kind of code word they're going to say for it. Um, and now, but that just leaves Democrats get the easy argument, we are on the side of voter rights which I think just dovetails really neatly into, you know, the, we've got HR1, which uh, Schumer says he's going to bring to the floor, which, you know, wouldn't protect from all of these kind of voter suppressive bills, but would at least fend off some of the, the worst parts of them. Um, and you had Diane Feinstein say through an aide yesterday that she's basically in favor of doing a carve out of the filibuster to pass HR1, you know? So it's kind of, I think it, it works really well for Democrats in that the things that Republicans are getting themselves spending all their airtime on, like that's the only thing they want to talk about right now. Democrats can say, okay, well, you're like throwing this fit. We're going to be on the side of voter rights and here's our voting rights package, which obviously Republicans are going to filibuster. And then you have that tension point, which is what filibuster act uh, anti filibuster activists have been promoting for months and months now that voting rights is where this is going to happen because you have to enshrine people's right to vote both because it's integral to our democracy, but also because if Republicans are allowed to keep suppressing votes this way, I mean, Democrats are just never going to win again. So I think in this, in this instance, Republicans chosen cancel culture war kind of sets the Democrats up right where they want to be, um, uh, you know, just to, to get HR one up talk, they want to be talking voting rights. So that Republicans are by extension, I think works well for them. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, well, I think that's all the time we have today, but. Um... Yeah, let me remind everybody that the Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. You can get 25% off your first order at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. And David, uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for guys. Being, for being part of the show and being part of the organization for like I said, uh, over a span of 10 plus years. Yeah, totally. Uh, pleasure podcasting with you and talk to you all soon. All right. All right, Later, bye. folks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.